All right, guys, welcome to RC Mojo. This week, we're going to finish up bag E and get the chassis rolling on the Scania 770S. Last week, we got as far as fitting the tanks. So this week, we start with the side skirts. We're only going to be doing enough of the build to make the truck, well, look like a truck. We'll be skipping things like the LED mounts and most of the bits that need gluing. We'll come back to them later, though, when the wiring has been worked out and the bits have been painted. Right, step 36, side skirt 1. We need four m 2 by 5s for the skirt mounts, H4, the skirt, and two Z9 mounts. The rest of the bits are for the lights, so we're going to leave them out. So all we do is offer up a mount to the holes near the end of the skirt and thread in two of the screws. The mounts do have a right way up. On one side there's a little tab that needs to be towards the top. Install both and that's the first skirt ready to fit. Step 37, side skirt 2. This one is a bit different as the skirt hinges open for access to the control panel. We need two 2x8 self tappers, an M 2x5 capper, H5 the skirt and Z5 the hinge. The hinge fits at one end of the skirt, and it's pretty obvious where it goes, as it's the only spot where the holes line up, and it mounts with the two 2x8 two self-tappers. At the other end, we fit the cap head, which just threads into a hole with the tab just above. We're not mounting anything with the screw, it's only there for the magnet on the chassis to grab hold of. Step 38, fitting the skirts. We need two M3x10s, and oddly enough, a damper shaft or in this case, it's more of a hinge pin. On the left hand side, the side skirt offers up over the metal mounts and we thread in the two M3s. It's a bit different to the older kits where the screws go in from the side of the skirt. With this one, there's no visible fixings or screw holes, which is a major plus. On the other side, we can stick the skirt to the magnet while lining up the hinge. Flip the chassis over and screw in the damper shaft. For the final fit, we will use a little bit of thread lock, but for now it's going to stay dry, so it's easy to remove when we want to paint it. Overall, it's quite a neat setup, but the metal mounts are a bit flexible. It works as it is, but the gap at the rear isn't quite right. Off camera, I'll tweak the bends a bit to get things just so. I suppose we could 3D print some parts just to square things up. It just feels a bit wobbly. We'll come back to that at some point in the future. Okay, step 39, tread plates. Now, I know I said that we're not going to be gluing things, but the tanks have already been painted, so there's no reason not to. Plus, we need to finalise the steering servo arm. We need to make sure that the end of the arm clears the plates. So we can move the steering servo. I'm going to hook up a receiver and receiver battery. We could just as easily use a servo tester, but I fancy using a radio for this bit. When setting up the steering, we guessed how long that the arm needs to be, roughly copying the stock servo saver. The plates for the steering side are GG7 and GD10, GD10 being the interesting one. If we offer it up to the top of the tank, we can see if it fits. And it doesn't. It is close though. If we move the steering, we can get the plate to drop into position. When moving the steering back to centre, the plate pops out but it's not moving very far. So I'm going to cut up yet another aluminium arm and set it up so it's a millimetre or so shorter. Not too much different. It might have been easier to size up the arm after having all the other bits on the chassis, but the arms are very cheap, so it's no huge loss. OK, now we have some clearance, we can glue on the plates. I'm going to use some Revell poly cement, which will attach the parts nicely. For best results, though, we don't want to be gluing the paint. If I wasn't in such a hurry, I would have masked up the places where we're going to be gluing, but I didn't. So we're going to have to scrape the paint with a knife. Not ideal, but it'll work. Glue the plates on, square them up, and leave them alone to dry. On the other side, we have one big plate, GG9. And on this side, I did mask off the area that's going to get glued. So we just need to add some glue and pop the plate on. Now the glue is going to take quite a while to harden up, but the next step is a sub-assembly, so we can put the chassis off to the side until it's ready. Step 40, the coupler. We need a M3x10, three countersunk M3x8s, two M2x5s, an M3 flange nut, an M3 press nut, which is a round widget with teeth on one side, 
a four millimeter ball end, a coupler nut, return spring, and the support spring. Then we have the metal plate, X3 the top bit, X4 the lever, X2 the MFC switch cover, and X1 the slider for the switch. Okay, first we'll get the lever ready, and the hole furthest from the pivot point gets the ball end fitted. It goes through the side that sticks out, and just needs to be snug. There's no point in doing it up super tight, just make sure it's seated against the plastic. In the other hole, we need to use a M2x5 to fit the return spring. This time we want to set the screw so the spring can still freely move around. The easiest method is to carefully tighten the screw until it just grabs the spring, then back it off a bit until the spring can move. Next we'll fit the plate to X3. We just sit it in, then pop in a countersunk screw in the end hole that's on its own. It's a plain hole that uses the flange nut to attach. We can use some thread lock and just take up the slack to hold the plate in roughly the right spot for the rest of the assembly. It just makes it a bit easier to line things up if it's not all floating around. We'll go around and nip up the screws properly in a bit. In the middle hole we can pop in another countersunk screw. Then we need to prep the coupler nut. It just needs a smear of thread lock in the threads. Just enough to get into the threads, but not so much it's going to come out and gum up the lever. Then we add a spot of grease into the hinge hole on the lever, spread it around a bit, and we slide in the coupler nut. It then gets offered up to the screw we fitted in the middle hole, and while holding it all together, we can take up the slack in the screw. Again, for now, we're not going to nip it up tight until the third countersunk screw goes in. One of the tricky bits now, we need to use the second M2x5 to attach the other end of the return spring to X3. We need to slightly stretch the spring while threading in the screw. Be careful though, as it will take the screw and ping it across the bench if you're not keeping hold of everything. Just the same as the other end, we want it so the spring can freely move and isn't bound up by the screw head. As a quick test, the lever should move freely and spring back with a nice snappy action. If it's a bit slow or sticky, find out why. But keep in mind the screws aren't tight yet, so we'll need to double check when they are. Next we'll fit the MFC switch cover, which I suppose if you're not going to fit an MFC you could skip, but I like to have it ready to go, so if I do want to fit a switch, it's there ready. And maybe the spring might just help keep the pin in position. Probably not, but it certainly can't hurt. Right, first we need to fit the press nut. We need to, as the name suggests, press it in place, or rather pull it in place with the M3x10. We pop the press nut into its hole, teeth first, then we thread in the M3x10, gently pulling it so the teeth stop the nut spinning. Once it's in as far as you can go by hand, tighten it up fully with a screwdriver, then remove the screw. The nut should still be in the hole with the teeth well and truly dug in. We need to make sure the slider is going to be very free to move, so we'll need to add some grease to the slot in X3 where the slider slides up and down. Next inside the slider where the spring goes we're going to add some more grease, partly for lubrication and partly so when we put the spring in it'll hold it in position while we get everything lined up. The slider and spring should then just drop in. We start with a bit of an angle, compress the spring and the slider should find its way down into the slot. Now we can add a tiny bit of thread lock to the threaded hole in the plate for the M3x10 and a little bit of thread lock in the press nut. Offer the cover up over the slider and we install the countersunk screw from the top into the press nut and the M3x10 from the bottom into the plate. Then we go round and nip up all the screws so they're nice and tight. Now if we end up fitting a coupler switch, we just need to remove those last two screws, lift up the slider and install the switch. Reassemble and then add the tiny 1.2mm screw that pins the switch into position. Fairly straightforward, but I'm planning to do something with an optical sensor for trailer detection, so no moving parts. But I'm not sure how that's going to turn out just yet. Once all the screws are tight, give the lever another test to make sure it's all nice and free. And using some tweezers or a small screwdriver, check the slider slides and pings back nicely. If it's sticky, find out why now before moving on. Step 42, the coupler linkage. This is one of those steps that's 
almost not really a step at all. We're going to need the two rod ends and the 2 by 75 millimeter rod. To build, all we do is grab the rod and screw a rod end on each end. Tamiya wants 65 millimeters between the inside faces of the rod ends, but it's really not all that critical. Right, step 43, fitting the coupler to the plate. We need two M3x8s, a single 3x10 washer head self tapper, an M2 nut, a 2mm E clip, a 4mm ball end, a 5x4mm round bushing, and a hold spring. Then we have the metal bracket to mount the coupler, G8 the coupler plate, Z11 the lever plate, and G4 the lever. Also there's the link pin, but we'll bring that out in a moment. First, pop the bracket in between the legs of the plate that we mounted in the coupler. Then we slide the spring over the link pin right up to the flange and orientate it to match the diagram. Then we slide it all the way through the assembly so the end of the link pin pokes out the other end and we can clip an e-clip into the slot. Check the bracket can pivot nice and freely and doesn't catch on anything. Every now and again you do have to tweak the bends a little. Then we can offer it up to the coupler plate, lining the holes in the bracket up with the holes in the plate, while also making sure the end of the spring is sat in a rectangular pocket in the plate. If it's not, the spring can find its way into places it's not supposed to go, and the coupler just won't spring back properly. From the bottom, we use the two M3 screws. As usual, a bit of Loctite isn't a bad idea, but I'm going to leave them dry as there's a good chance they're going to get removed before too long for some upgrades. The last job with the coupler is to snap in the linkage. The small rod ends are pretty soft, so it's easy to do just with a bit of a squeeze. For the lever, we just need to install the ball end and nut. One side of the lever has a hex hole for the nut, so we pop it in and thread in the ball end from the other side and nip it up. Next we slide the bushing in from the bottom, line it up over the hole in the lever plate and thread in the self tapper. It's not a great assembly, the lever does catch on the screws that we installed in the next step, it works fine for releasing the coupler. It'll be replaced with a servo release before long, so I'm not going to spend too much time tinkering. Step 43, fitting the plates. We need six M3x6s and the chassis. To mount, we position the lever plate over its hole in the chassis and install the two screws. Offer up the coupler plate and install its four screws. Then clip the linkage onto the lever. Make sure the coupler can move nicely on the plate and the lever opens up the coupler. If it doesn't, fix it now, otherwise we can move on. Step 44, the front arches. We need 10 3x10 self tappers, the two inner arches W7 and 8, the plate G6, the body tongue G4, and the two bobbin caps, the two G2s. Now I decided to skip the outer arches as they're supposed to be glued on and I didn't want to do that before painting them. However, I did end up fitting them temporarily with some double sided tape once I saw how it looked with the cab on. Right, starting simple, we'll install the bobbin caps. They fit over the posts at the front of the plate and get a screw each. They're mainly there to wind up the excess wire you end up with with the MFC LEDs. Quite handy to have if you're not doing something custom. On the other end we can install the tongue that locks into the back of the cab. Again it just uses two screws to attach. And slightly interestingly it's quite an old part. It gets used on some of the CCO1 chassis too. Same part but on a different parts tree. Next on the bottom of the plate we can install the two inner arches with three screws each. It's worth noting, although a little bit awkward, you can remove these screws when the plate is attached to the chassis. So if you do a dry build before painting you can remove them without dismantling too much of the front end. Step 45, the RC deck. We won't be fitting the seat bases so all we need is four 3x8 self tappers and the G1 deck. To fit, we just sit the deck on the top plate and install the four screws. Now, it's fairly important to fit the deck as it does add a lot of rigidity to the structure. Without it, I reckon the arches would be prone to moving with the flexibility of the plate and maybe catching on the tyres. Okay, step 46, fitting the plate. All we need is six M3x6s, the plate and the chassis. 
To assemble, we need to fish the servo and motor wires through somewhere sensible so they don't get pinched. Then we line the plate up with the six holes in the top of the chassis. Now, as the manual suggests, getting the plate past all the gubbins on the chassis can be a bit tricky. Just keep in mind, when it's all lined up, it'll drop into place without the use of any force. And finally, to attach, we use the six screws, nip them up, and that's the plate fitted. Step 47 is the electronics install, either a basic radio and ESC or the full MFC. I don't have the motor and radio I'm planning to use just yet though, so I'm going to lash something up off camera. It'll just be a basic three channel receiver and ESC, so you're not going to be missing much. Over the page is a pair of rather nice diagrams for the MFC install, with the LEDs and connector numbers. Great if you're going to go full Tamiya. I'd really like to see the older kit manuals updated to include the MFC setup too, rather than having bits of info in the kit manual and other bits in the MFC manual, it would clear up a lot of confusion for new builders. Ok, step 48 tells us how to install the battery, which is fair enough, but we're not quite ready for that. Step 49 has info on setting up the steering and gearbox, but of course we're not using the Tamiya parts, so we can skip that too. Which brings us to step 50, the wheels and tyres. We need 12 M2 by 5 cap heads, 12 M2 nuts, all the wheels, but not the chrome rings for the front ones as they need gluing, and we need some tyres. First job, we need to fit all the tyres. They just stretch over the wheels until the beads are nicely seated. The only thing to think about is which way round the tyres go. One side has Tamiya on the sidewall, the other side only has the tyre size. The tread is symmetrical though, so it's just the Tamiya logo to consider. Once they're all on, Tamiya wants us to add some glue, but I've never really felt the need on the lorries. The tyres stay put just fine as they are. Adding glue only risks making a bit of a mess. Next we need to make up the rear dualies. Each pair has an inner and an outer wheel, where the inner has the hex on the inside and the outer has just a plain hole. To assemble, the inner and the outer have pins and holes that interlock. Then we install three nuts and three screws. The nuts drop into small hex holes, then we install the screws from the outside. Now these screws are very prone to coming loose, so a little bit of thread lock on the threads and then loosening and retightening the screws is a bit of a must. It is super critical you don't let any get on the plastic though. I've had the inner of a wheel shatter because I went a bit over the top with the thread lock. Although, actually thinking about it, if you have some M2 nylock nuts, they would work a treat and they wouldn't risk the plastic. Yeah, I wish I thought of that sooner. Anyway, rinse and repeat and you should have two front wheels and four dualies ready to go. Step 51, fitting wheels. We need six M4 flange nylock nuts, four 1150 bearings, two of which I've already fitted for testing, and four hex adapters. Now to fit the rear wheels, we just drop a hex adapter onto a shaft, follow it with a wheel, and spin it until it drops onto the hex. Then we install a nut, repeat with the other three, and that's the rear end done. For the front wheels, we need to press a bearing into each side of a wheel, then it drops onto a spindle, and we install a nut, which should be the end of it. Bottoming out the nut on the stock axle should work fine. However, with this setup, I was getting a bit of rubbing with the tyre and the arm on the knuckle. I installed the nuts anyway and had a bit of a think. A little while later, I found the small bushings that Tammy provide with various kits, the 850 size, spaces the wheels out just far enough, but still lets the outer bearing run on the spindle. A bit of a hack, but it does work. I'll probably look into something a bit thinner, but it's pretty good as it is. For now, I've also popped in a 6L 9MI pack, purely because the ESC I'm using for the time being has a Tamiya connector. The final setup we use XT60s and a LiPo, but this will get us up and running. And speaking of the ESC, I'm using the Carson that came with the Tamiya Wild one that we built a few weeks ago. It should be perfectly good for testing, maybe not the smoothest at low throttle though. And for the receiver, we've got a Flysky 3 channel, which is paired with a GT3C with 8 channel firmware. If we power it up and twiddle some controls, 
Well, first you can see the steering is far more responsive than a stock setup. There's still a bit of play in there, but that's largely down to the plastic servo mount and the plastic arms on the crank. I'll swap them out off camera for metal parts when they arrive, since they fit identically to the stock parts. And once we've got the cab roughly assembled and the final motor and ESC installed, we'll do a bit of a comparison to a Tamiya Man 6x4 with a completely stock steering setup. I can tell you now though from a quick test in the hallway, the difference is quite amazing. Anyway, we now have a running chassis, so that's it for this week. As always, thanks for watching, like if you like, subscribe if you haven't, and leave a comment if there's something on your mind. Bye guys!